Hey folks, welcome back to Gaming Garbage, where we take a look at games, review the ones that we can, chat about the gaming news in the industry, and of course, stream for fun. So today we're going to be talking about Lords of the Fallen. This is going to be coming out on October 13th, 2023. And I think this is important because a lot of people are relating it to Dark Souls. I think my audio's okay. Let me check. I think my audio's okay. Let me check. So far. I think it sounds okay so far. Okay. So let's get started. So, the re yeah, again, the reason I want to get into Lords of the Fallen is because... First, we need to talk a little bit about what the game is. It has been compared to Dark Souls or like Elden Ring. Elden Ring, as we all know, was a really, really big game and uh, sold extremely well. But uh, I want to be able to kind of dig into what Lords of the Fallen is that's releasing this year. I also want to look at the previous Lords of the Fallen that came out in 2014, so about nine years ago. I got my windows open, just so you guys know. It's pretty warm out here still. And then I, next, I want to look at that transition period that Lords of the Fallen went through between then to now. And then uh, I actually want to look at the game itself on what we have. There is an IGN gameplay trailer. There's been some other cinematic trailers as well. And uh, and some other articles that have been released. And even some, some uh, interviews that the devs have um, had talking about the game and the structure and the gameplay and kind of how things are designed. And overall, I'm excited. I do have some concerns, but let's dig right into it. So, and I will be comparing this too to some of the Dark Souls games and also Elden Ring. To an extent. Not a ton, but a little bit. So, Lords of the Fallen. This is a Dark Souls-like game. We're going to be in the world of Axiom. But also we're going to have a parallel universe, or world, of Umbriel. These are going to be simultaneously overlaid each other. Um, but you only be able to kind of visually see one at a time. So you're going to be able to have a lantern that will allow you to see and also transition to the Umbriel world. And this is going to be important because this puts in a whole new mechanic of kind of the life and death cycle in a game. Of when you're alive in Axiom, you know, everything's kind of normal, everything's like you would expect it to be. When you die, you go to Umbriel, and you still have another chance to basically get back to the living world. But things are different, they're darker, the enemies change. Technically, the area that you're in is the same, but there's like, there's also different pathways. And this opens up other different things to be able to discover secrets or other areas in the game. Or even to be able to progress forward. The story itself is takes off of just the original Lords of the Fallen back in 2014. So 2014, basically you're trying to eliminate uh, a demon god called Adir. And in this one, coming out this year, basically Adir is back. And you're you're sent to pretty much kill the demon uh, that is allowing all of this evil to enter the land and turn it into darkness. And you are one of the few that's able to fight back. Um, the overall interactions in the game for progression are six beacons. These six beacons you'll be able to see throughout the world. And I'm sure both all of these beacons will also have a main boss that you'll have to engage with. Kind of like the Elden Runes. Uh, the Elden Ring runes that you get after a boss fight. Is you're really trying to like piece together the ultimate Elden Ring rune with all of its pieces to become Elden Lord, right? Except in this case, you're trying to shut all of these beacons off so that ultimately you can get to a deer and defeat a deer. Uh, this is going to release on PC. This is also going to release on the current gen consoles. So PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. Past gen is not going to be a thing. So having the overview of the game, we first need to look at kind of the details and mechanics of the, of the first Lords of the Fallen back in 2014. So this was created by Deck 13. Some of you might remember that, that they also created the Surge. 
Uh, so Deck 13 and CI. CI is the actual parent company that really owns the IP. So again, kind of the idea was to, you know, take the land back in Lords of the Fall in 2014 um, from a deer. Uh, the uh, the game itself had about 30 bosses, which was pretty good for back then. It was uh, kind of on par with what some of the Dark Souls games had. So let me look at these other ones, uh, these other From Software games. So Dark Souls 1 had about 20 bosses. Dark Souls 2 had about 32. Dark Souls 3 had about 25. Uh, Bloodborne had about 22. Um, Demon Souls had about 25. Sekiro had about 31. And Elden Ring had 83. Not freaking nuts. And so 30 is kind of on par with what was normal. And this is important because I'll, it'll help explain something in the new game that's coming out. Also in the Lords of the Fallen 2014, we had a range of weapons. Anything from kind of like axes to long swords to short swords, daggers, and shields, that kind of thing. We also had different enemies and different enemy types. The completion of the entire game was about 35, 40 hours. Um, with some, a little bit of maybe replayability as there were some different endings in the game. Uh, there were three types of magic in the game. And you could kind of focus to, you know, grow or, or uh, upgrade those magic types. There were also three types of classes. So one that focused on combat, another one that was kind of focused on swiftness, and another one that was focused on magic. There was no co-op in the game and there were no invasions. The game itself had checkpoints, just kind of like what we know as a bonfire from Dark Souls, or like a Sight of Grace in Elden Ring. This allowed you to heal and to replenish certain items in the game. Again, as I mentioned, there were three separate endings, and depending on your decisions later in the game, or, or toward the end, it would dictate what the endings were. Uh, the combat was pretty slow-paced, like Dark Souls 1. Uh, if you could uh, equate it to that, or even like Demon Souls. Though I haven't played Demon Souls, but I, I'm playing through Dark Souls 1 right now, by the way, if you want to check those out. Lion and I are having a blast going through the game, and we're going to continue on through the series. But it was kind of slow-paced. You can kind of see the movements, you know, coming, but you kind of have to be, still be tactical about it, because if you were too slow, um, then you'd be getting slashed and hacked, and that definitely happened to me quite a few times. Checking my audio there. Uh, let's see. Personally, I didn't like the game, Lords of the Fallen 2014, because there was a lack of armor, a small array of weapons compared to what I was normal in a Dark Souls game, and also the combat was very, very slow, and it was frustrating. It was really hard to get into a rhythm. It was really hard to kind of anticipate, because sometimes it felt like some of the enemies were faster than you, were, than you could react, and other times the enemies were so slow, you were already reacting and getting into an anim animation, and then they would be able to hit you without you being able to guard yourself. So it was pretty often I, <laughs> I died. Again, I only played maybe about an hour and a half, two hours of Lords of the Fallen back in 2000. 2014 and having played you know been spoiled on the from software games i just couldn't get into it the overall scores when it launched back in 2014 were strong 60s and low 70s there was one company that gave it a low 80 but generally the consensus was that it was fairly good for what it was but it was still lacking some experiences it was lacking some variety um and the combat was at a very slow pace and some people really didn't enjoy that. And the game itself sometimes, in a way, felt very small compared to Dark Souls games. So now we get to the current Lords of the Fallen. So this is coming out again October 13th, 2023. But we need to actually look at the development of this. So a couple of months right after Lords of the Fallen 2014 was released, we got confirmation later in the year that Lords of the Fallen 2 was confirmed. And so it's like, hey, all right. So it didn't necessarily do that great, though. They were hoping for a better reception than what they got. It wasn't absolutely horrible, but still it wasn't great either. So CI announced that they were going to be working on the game themselves. Um, but 
Uh, they also had an original release date of 2017, so this was giving them three years to kind of work on the game, but that was kind of short-lived. So, the, uh, let's see, hold on here. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the, uh, CI itself decided to eventually hand over the project to Defiant Studios in 2018 because the game was being delayed. Lords of the Fallen 2 just wasn't exactly coming out like they were wanting, and so they handed it off to another studio, and CI was going to publish the project. Though in April of 2020, CI decided to remove Defiant Studios from the project. They were no longer going to work on it, and CI was creating an in-house subsidiary studio called Hexworks. And they are based out of Barcelona and... Oh, I forget the other one. They both start with a B. <laughs> I forget. But they're basically two studios, and Hexworks was going to be working on this game um, as a standalone project. They weren't going to be working on anything else. And again, these guys were started in April of 2020. So this was right when the COVID was starting to get big. We had lockdown starting in May and June, depending on where you lived in the world. And this was their only project. But they were passionate about it. They knew they were a smaller studio, and they were kind of focused on having an indie approach of actually creating an experience instead of actually trying to create money, like some of the bigger companies do. And so, so far, with what we've seen, Hex Hexworks has still been working on this project. It's still in-house, so CI is able to closely kind of keep an eye on how they're de making and designing things for about the last four years now. And what we've been seeing is we've had some cinematic trailers, we've had some articles, we've had a few interviews. Please look those up if you're interested, but I think the most telling one is the gameplay trailer that was just released um, maybe a few weeks or maybe a month ago. And uh, you can go to IGN's website or type in IGN on YouTube, and they have a gameplay trailer right there. And it's, it, in my opinion, it's very telling. Haven't watched it a couple of times now. Um, this is what really stood out to me in the game, and then I'm going to go over kind of the differences in Dark Souls and Elden Ring. So... What we do know from one of the interviews is that this Lords of the Fallen is significantly bigger than the previous game. There's now hundreds of weapons. So we have swords, daggers, axes, halberds, shields, large swords, smaller shields. We have claws. We can even use our fists, I believe. And there's also different finishing moves and attacks. We still have critical um, backstabs and attacks and stuff like that. And we also have a parry system. We all have nine classes now instead of the previous three in the last game. We still have three main magic types, basically fire, electricity, and, you know, umbral, death. And then uh, the weapons and magic, this is actually really cool. So I haven't necessarily seen this in a game before. But you still have your basic kind of light and strong attacks for your weapon. Uh, but also you have five separate slots for, like, your magic or like your pyromancies or whatever else you're deciding to use. And so you can fill these slots and you can simultaneously add them to your combo, which is kind of nice. It doesn't work flawlessly like I saw in the gameplay trailer, but honestly it still works pretty good. And so you're able to kind of create unique and, and kind of adaptive combos to your character while you're playing the game. Some of the attacks also have ranged attacks. I don't know if this is certain weapons, or I don't know if this is a certain leveling up point with magic. But there is actually kind of like shock waves that you can send out, or small little kind of brush strokes of air or color. I don't even really know what else to call it. It's kind of like a force, a force arc, if I had to call it that. And we got to see some of these in Elden Ring come from some of these weapons. So again, it's not necessarily clear though exactly if it's coming from the weapon or if it's part of the magic of one of the five slots that you have. There's also fat. Uh, the the melee is honestly pretty quick. Even watching somebody that was from the studio playing the game, they were definitely getting hit sometimes and just basically had no time to react. And so you got to be on your guard. You got to be really watchful. You got to be paying attention. 
And yeah, this is definitely not like the combat in Dark Souls 1. And I would say this is a lot more like Elden Ring combat or Dark Souls 3. Or even Bloodborne, maybe, to an extent. Where the combat is just faster paced, it's on a whole new level. I wouldn't say it's as fast as Sekiro. I mean, Sekiro is so quick it makes my eyes bleed. I can't even keep up with what's going on in the screen. And I'm afraid if I do, I'm basically going to have a seizure. But still, the, the combat is pretty quick. And this is a huge, drastic change compared to what the original Lords of the Fallen was back in 2014. There's no loading screens in the game. The game does have co-op, but we only saw one additional player. And there's only certain areas, kind of like summoning pools in Elden Ring, of where you can summon other people into your game. And these summoning pools, I'll call them that for now, you have to find these in the game, in all of the different lands and worlds that you explore and, and fight through. And so there's kind of central hubs that you can stem from and progress forward and head toward the boss or head further into the land or whatever. Also, there will be invaders. So again, if I think it's going to be somewhat comparable to how many players you can have come in. So if you can only have one extra player come in, you're probably only going to get one invader. Which honestly, that's pretty nice. But you're still going to have invaders. Exactly what that's going to look like, or how often, or how it's comparable to Dark Souls, we don't know. We didn't get to see any of that. Um, but we do know there's at least going to be invaders. Uh, there's going to be, of course, a leveling up system. The gameplay video that we saw showed that all stats were at level 50, uh, which is pretty high. That could be a cap, or that could kind of be like a soft cap to, um, to the stats in the game. As we know in Dark Souls and Elden Ring, there's kind of like a soft cap of around like 30, and I think in Elden Ring, maybe it's around 40. Um, but like... The stats or the points that you're now putting into a certain thing like Vitality, it doesn't give you as much of a benefit as it used to. It doesn't give you as many points or produce as much damage or produce as much resistance. But the basically the skill tree system, if you want to call it that, is pretty much the same like in Dark Souls and Elden Ring. Is that basically there's Vitality, there's Resistance, there's Strength, and there's several others too that relate to like Magic and Equipment Load and things like that. Or your Stamina. And so, expect it to be very kind of Dark Souls-y, Elden Ring-y in that way. Oh, uh, let's see. Also, it's expressed in some of the articles that uh, you'll be able to customize your character as you level up and progress and grow in the game. So this is likely going to be armor pieces and armor sets, and also be able to unlock certain weapons that, have, that require bigger stats... Uh, or, or more stats or a wider variety than what the ones you start with in the game. And so again, that is very, very Dark Souls and very, very Elden Ring. We don't know how many bosses are in the game, but if it's significantly bigger than the previous Lords of the Fallen, and the Lords of the Fallen in 2014 already had 30 bosses, we can probably anticipate that this is probably going to have around maybe f this at least the same number, if not likely more. Because it wouldn't necessarily make sense to have this much bigger expanse. Let's say it's 25% bigger. Or even though this is an entirely different console and nine years later. Let's say this is, you know, maybe a 40 or 50% bigger game. And you would expect that the boss count would actually go up too. If it does, then this would actually be bigger than all of the other From Software games except for Elden Ring as most of them were around 30 or less. And this even included DLC. But yeah, with Elden Ring, they had 83. And if we have a game that already had 30 back, you know, nine years ago, we can anticipate that it'll probably be at least 40 or 50 bosses and sub-bosses in Lords of the Fallen, which I think is great. That's exciting. That's more content to go through. And then this wouldn't simply be just another 35 or 40 hours I really think this would kind of start to become maybe a 50 plus or maybe even a 100 hour game at a minimum, which is wonderful. I mean, we're honestly looking just for not 
necessarily really grindy games. We're looking for more games that are kind of progressive, that continue to tell a story, that kind of continue to give us something to work toward. And this is where some of the other games, they fall flat, even some of the really big studios, like Activision Blizzard or EA or Ubisoft or Square Enix, they don't really produce a lot of engagement. It's just like, well, do this, go here, produce that, go over there, grind some more. And that's just kind of what it feels like. And overall, it's generally kind of boring. But since Lord of the Fallen in 2014 didn't have any form of multiplayer, and this one does, man, you'll be able to share the experience with multiple people. You can either focus on a friend, or you can totally call in a random person, or even become somebody uh, of, somewhat of a helper yourself for other people in the game. So let's see, some of the biggest differences that I noticed... Probably the biggest one is the multi-dimensional world. And that both of these are simultaneous while you're playing. And so again, we've had Elden Ring, we've had Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and Sekiro, and even Demon Souls, where you kind of run through these different sections, and they look very different, and like you can tell there's kind of differences, and the enemy types change. And it's kind of nice to have these kind of different biomes in the game. But this is multi-dimensional, and there's not really many of those types of games out there. And usually, sometimes, this isn't necessarily done very well either. But from what I was seeing in the gameplay trailer, man, it opens up a whole other kind of aspect of, of risk. Because if you open up the freaking portal with your lantern... You can walk in, and other enemies can also walk out into your living world. And there is a risk with dying, because then you go to Umbral, and now if you die there, well, you either probably lose some stuff, like some of your equivalent of souls, which we get to see the character absorbing some of that after they kill each enemy. But two, it, it opens up a whole other kind of landscape where maybe you can't get over there, but maybe you can in an umbral maybe there's some kind of bridge and anything yeah any location at all you can just lift up your lamp and rev kind of reveal the umbral world around you and i actually kind of really like that we know too that there's secret locations in the game we know too that also not all bosses are going to be necessary and we also know that there's probably likely to be some hidden items in some of these secret areas or locations exactly what that's going to look like or how many or what that'll entail we don't know but uh my guess is that it'd be again somewhere kind of like a dark souls game so i'm really excited about that multi-dimensional um the other thing is you know it looks like we'll only be able to summon one player uh, but also we'll be able to have one invader at a time I, we don't know if you'll have to summon someone in order to get an invader or kind of be like humanified or be human again or whatever in order to be invaded. Or if you could just be invaded at any time. We don't necessarily know. Well, another big difference is the, uh, the spell casting. So the fact that you can basically have five slots for spell casting pretty much. I don't know if it's right at the start of the game or if you have to earn some like an Elden Ring. We don't know that either. But the gameplay trailer did show that there were five. And the really cool thing is, again, you can just use these anytime you want. You don't have to switch to a type of enchantment or a handkerchief or some kind of pendant or some kind of staff uh, in order to cast. You can literally just freaking cast right there while you're in combat. And that, too, is kind of a, a really nice difference, in my opinion, from what we see in a lot of the Dark Souls games. It kind of reminds me of Sekiro, where you can just kind of, whoop, you can just kind of shove it out there and... And uh, maybe buy yourself some timers, inflict some massive damage. So relating this a little more to Elden Ring, I don't think this game is going to be on the scale of Elden Ring. Again, going back and taking a look at the gameplay trailers, taking a look at the cinematic trailers that they've released, and kind of how some of the interviews were talked about with some of the devs, I don't think it's going to be as large in, as Elden Ring. Which, let's face it, I mean, my first Elden Ring playthrough was 357 hours, which is crazy. And uh, I haven't even started New Game Plus yet. I technically beat it. But do I think it's going to be that big? No. I'm hoping it's going to be around maybe 75 or 100 hours for my first playthrough. 
and that there will be like a new game plus or maybe some different endings as well in the game which is which would kind of give some replayability or even just picking a different class as there's eight other classes compared to the first one that you picked but yeah, I don't think it's going to be as big. I think it's going to be more kind of designed and built and lengthy like a Dark Souls game. Whether it's Dark Souls 1, 2, or 3, all of those are kind of a little different. We also have Bloodborne and Sekiro. We don't exactly know, but it plays a lot more kind of like... Um, it, it, yeah, it kind of plays a lot more kind of like a Dark Souls 3 or like a Bloodborne game. I would say more than than Dark Souls 1 or Dark Souls 2, at least from what I saw in the gameplay. So the melee is faster, there's more engagement, there's a wider variety of weapons, there's different types of enemies, which is nice. Um, but yeah, we'll really have to see when we get one. And I did pre-order it, and I am actually still quite excited. Uh, but I think uh, the overall is that, you know, the expectation... So don't expect this to be a From Software game, because it's not a From Software game. It's a Dark Souls-like genre. And so that's what we should expect. We should kind of have a realistic expectation that the game is going to be much better than the original Lords of the Fallen. This too is also designed differently from a different studio where this has been their sole project and this is their first big project. So they're either going to totally foobar it up or it's actually going to be fairly good. I don't think it's necessarily going to be in the middle. One thing that does worry me, though, is that the lack of enemy density. So when we're looking through the gameplay trailer, again, go to IGN and take a look at it yourself. Um, it really reveals a lot about the game. But there were quite a few areas where there just really weren't that many enemies. We didn't really see any ambushing. We, we, we could kind of see that a little bit. So you do have to be careful around corners or stairs or kind of around crates and stuff. But overall, like... Taking a look at it, I didn't really feel like there was a dense populace of enemies where really I would kind of come to it and be like, oh, wow, I might really want some help with this one. I don't know if I can do this by myself unless I level up quite a bit more or maybe even change some weapons and play around and just trial and error until I finally make it. A lot of times we just saw one enemy, maybe three enemies, and honestly, some of them were dispatched pretty easily, so then you're just down to one guy. And, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one is a heck of a lot easier than three-on-one or five-on-one. We didn't re necessarily either see a lot of difficult enemies, except for maybe a couple of bosses. Um, but yeah, the enemies we did see, because three different lands or worlds, if you will, uh, they didn't seem overly difficult. So I do worry a little bit about the challenging aspect of the game. I'm hoping the game is challenging enough. We did see that the person playing during the gameplay trailer we did see that they got hit but i never felt like they were necessarily in danger they were doing pre except for maybe a boss fight they were doing pretty good they were dispatching their enemies pretty quickly they were having fun using magic and melee and trying out different weapons and so but uh, yeah i didn't necessarily feel like the player was challenged again the player had all of their stats at level 50 and that's pretty freaking high, if you ask me. Um, they'd have to level, like, a couple of hundred times in order to actually get to that point. Um, if they're able to level up once at a time. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little worried about that one, probably. And I'm also worried, too, about the... We did see some magic and, like, incantation equivalents. Um, but they didn't necessarily feel like they were spammed to death. But the thing I do worry about is that the invaders will. So they'll have magic along with melee and being able to have an easier time kicking your butt while you're trying to just survive in the world or get further to your next kind of like bonfire or site of grace. That's going to be something that's going to be kind of frustrating. So again, invaders, no one really necessarily likes invaders except for the invaders themselves. But uh, it's going to be helpful, I think, to have a buddy around. Uh, last thing is that the base game is $70. And there are uh, two different editions above that with different price, with higher price points. But yeah, the base game itself is 70 bucks, So they're fairly confident that it's worth $70. And the Lords of the Fallen, if I remember right, was either 50 or 60 bucks, 
and it wasn't very long. It wasn't as many classes, but overall, I am excited for this Lords of the Fallen releasing later this year. It honestly looks pretty good. Again, some probably some of the biggest things I'm excited about is, yay, it's another freaking Dark Souls game, right? It's going to kind of resemble that, which is fun. I really enjoy those. So I do have some bias there. The next thing is we have this multi-dimensional kind of two worlds that are split. And you'll be able to transition in and out of those pretty much any time you want. Either visually or actually physically go in and out, which is great. We also have some difficulty with trying to get from point A to point B. And we can get help from co-op this time, unlike the first Lords of the Fallen. Uh, but we also have invaders this time too. So that adds a whole other dynamic to the game. I like too that the combat, you're able to have me melee integrated with spell casting pretty much on a whim whenever you want. This will give a wider variety for you to be able to deal and adapt with enemies, but also you're going to have issues probably with invaders as they're going to be able to do the same thing. And that the game is significantly bigger than 35-40 hours, we can probably expect this to be at least a 50 hour game if not bigger. And the fact that the previous game had 30 bosses, these, this game will probably have at least 40 or 50 bosses if not more than that. And again, the wide range of weapons and different armor pieces and stuff, I'm actually, yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. That's very Dark Soulsy Elden Ring. And, uh, and yeah, I'm excited about that. So, overall, I'm actually going to keep my pre-order. Um, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm actually more excited for this than I was for Assassin's Creed Mirage. Even though Mirage is 50 bucks, I'm paying another $20 just for the base game. I'm actually kind of really excited about this one. Now again, I still I still love Dark Souls games, right? I mean, I've, I'll be playing them for the rest of my life and I have that bias, but I'm excited about some of the innovation that they have and I'm most excited for trying to discover some of the different areas in the game, the hidden secrets and hidden items and maybe even hidden bosses in the game with your lantern and being able to kind of move in and out of Umbriel while you're while you're alive. And so, yeah, we'll kind of have to see how they do. You know, let's keep an eye on this one. We still have a few months left and some news can change and or things can even be delayed between now and then. But man, if it doesn't get delayed, I'd say that's actually a pretty good sign. What I saw was pretty well polished. There were a lot of good things that they showed in the gameplay trailer. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited. So, I'm not as excited um, as, let's say, Starfield, uh, or maybe even Armored Core, um, or maybe even uh, Metal Gear Solid Collection 1. Uh, that'll be coming out also in October. But, yeah, this one is definitely in the top five of probably games all year. So, Armored Core, I'm going to wait. Elden, uh, Starfield, yeah, Elden Ring. Man, I would love to have another Elden Ring. I'd buy that right away. Hundred bucks. Take my money. Anyway, uh, Starfield, um, I'm excited that one uh, the most. I will be pre-ordering that one. And then uh, I am going to be getting Lords of the Fallen. But man, I'm only going to have like five or six weeks along with work and family. Man, that's going to be a tough deal. Um, but I'm going to be streaming those two games pretty often. And then if I have some extra cash, then I'm going to be getting, uh, the Metal Gear Solid collection, which is going to have five games shoved into basically one collection. So, And that Metal Gear Solid collection is also for Xbox and for PlayStation, which is great. So anyway, thanks for tuning in, folks. I hope you have, Hopefully you guys are doing well. You can find me at uh, Don't Tread on Thee on Twitch, and you can also find me at GamingGarbage22 on YouTube. I have links for both. Um, on my Twitch and on my YouTube, so you can, should be able to find me pretty easily. Um, my YouTube is really the one that I'm focusing on. Um, I'm having a difficult time having kind of a schedule for when I do stuff on Twitch, because I just kind of do stuff when I have time. Um, but uh, if you guys have any su suggestions on 
any type of a schedule counter kind of thing where you guys would be able to see if you'd be interested in that, please let me know what those are, whether it's a, a separate app or an extension through Twitch or something else. Let me know what you guys use or what you guys would suggest because I would like to be able to, when I do know I'm going to do something, I would like to be able to kind of put that up there to uh, to broadcast uh, when I'm going to stream into the future. Also, YouTube, since that's basically the main thing that I'm focusing on, there are plenty of stuff on there. I got over 300 videos now. About 100 of them-ish are, are shorts. It's kind of how I try to promote the channel and just get me in front of other people's face to let them know that I exist. Um, but there's a lot of other content on there, too. So I'm going through Game Pass. Is it worth it? So I have the playlist called Off the Cuff, where we're just taking a look at games, maybe spending 30 minutes to an hour in each game. And two, don't forget to vote. There's a vote right now for this week. To, uh, there's basically, there's five random numbers that I used a random numbers generator on. And basically pick a number. Vote for a number. And that's the game on Game Pass that I'm going to play. So, yeah. Help me decide what I should play. I mean, it's kind of curious. Let's see what we get. I also have um, Dark Souls that I'm going through with Lion on a Dark Souls 1. Uh, we're on our 20... We've done 22 sessions now. And they're basically all uploaded. So, uh, quite the playlist there. I got another buddy, a Shepard, that I'm doing World at War co-op campaign with. And then after that, we're going to do Black Ops 3 co-op campaign. And you know, we might be finding some, something else um, later on. But I'm not really sure yet. Um, maybe. I don't know. We'll see how he feels about it. Um, but Lion and I, man, we got quite the lineup of multiplayer games, co-op games that we want to do. And, uh, yeah, stay tuned for those. My wife and I, too, we're also going to be looking at doing It Takes Two. And that's basically a relationship kind of marriage counseling game. Uh, very basic, but I think it's a good place to start if you need some cheap counseling. But we want to be able to go through it and kind of share some of the struggles and successes and victories that we've had in our marriage. We're six year, almost six years now and, and going great and strong. And we have a lot of people that are having troubles in their marriages right now or have even been through divorce and so we're just like man we feel like we're doing great and everyone else is kind of falling apart and so we just kind of want to be able to share some of the wisdom and lessons that we've learned uh while we play through it takes two and hey if that helps somebody wonderful that's really kind of the goal so you can stay tuned for that later this year let's see what else is on there uh, i also do campaigns for games so i got Project Wingman and the Dead Space Remake. I got the full campaigns on there. And so you can take a look at those two. I think the next campaign that I'm going to do is actually Ace Combat 7. Quite a few of you enjoyed Project Wingman. And um, I really enjoy the uh, flight simulators. And I like playing story games too. So when I don't have time to do everything else, I'm going to be having some, uh, some solo campaigns that are going to crop up for every now and then. And then of course I do gaming news. So I do gaming news once a week on the weekend. I'm just kind of like the main stuff that came out during that week. And then I also do stuff like this. And then, if there isn't enough to do already, we also do... Uh, I also do gaming previews, demos, and reviews. And the whole point of the channel, really, is to, to kind of chat about the gaming industry as a whole. Where it's been, where it is today, and where it's going. And to kind of work on holding these companies accountable that love to take our money and kind of scam us through some of these uh, trailers, uh, cinematic trailers that we see and get us hyped for something that is not necessarily what we expect. In my opinion, that's fraud. And companies like Ubisoft, EA, Square Enix, and Activision Blizzard have been doing a great job of making bad names in the industry. And partly it's to kind of bring some of that to light to hold these companies accountable. But it's also to help you guys save money because money's tight for everybody, especially right now. And it's not fun to buy a brand new game to feel like you got cheated. Just like Forspoken or like Redfall this year. We want to have games like Elden Ring or Hogwarts Legacy of, or God of War. Those are the games that we want. So, and also too, it's to invest in you guys. Lastly, you know, even though it's a little sappy and whatever, and I'm not trying to get all emotional on you, but I remember being a guy, being younger, being single, and I remember what that was like. And there really wasn't a lot of outlets even then 
to be able to get help or advice or glean wisdom from older people. And boy, it's definitely difficult now, especially after the lockdowns and COVID. And things are just really less social now. And so this channel is also to invest in you guys. And gals, if you guys are if you gals are out there, welcome to the channel. Sit back and just enjoy it for what it is. And maybe you'll learn something too about guys to help you just better understand about who we are. Because, uh, you know, no matter what side of the fence you're on, it's difficult to understand the other. So, yeah, this demographic that I have on the channel is 96% men. And so, yeah, it is a tough struggle going through life and figuring out exactly where you belong and uh, where you can get some advice from. And so there will be times where, yeah, some of the videos, uh, maybe I'll just have them on Twitch sometimes and other times I'll post them to the channel on YouTube. But it's really just to kind of chat about some life lessons that I've had or, or just what's on my mind. So, again, this isn't just about entertainment. This isn't just about accountability to these big companies. It's also to invest in you folks because somebody has to. And so with that, hopefully you guys are having a good one, and I'll see you on the next one.